Triangle is the ocean equivalent of the Amazon rainforest and one of the top priorities for marine conservation. Stretching from Indonesia to the Philippines and the Solomon Islands, the Coral Triangle covers 1.6 billion acres of coast and sea. hundred species of coral and 3,000 species of fish are found here. Turtles, dolphins and sharks feed, breed and cruise these sheltered waters. No wonder the World Wide Fund for Nature says that there is nowhere like the Coral Triangle anywhere in the world. Serge Coburn, a young Australian naturalist, wants to know how to protect the Coral Triangle for the future. He is joining a diving trip with the world's most famous veteran underwater filmmakers and photographers. How are you feeling, buddy? Yeah, pretty excited. <laughs> Nervous as well. <laughs> they have all been drawn here by the pristine underwater life. This, of course, is the finest diving area in the world. Stan Waterman, Ron and Valerie Taylor are celebrities in the diving world. I've been diving for over 50 years and I still get excited because I see things that I've never ever seen before. With their fellow divers, all underwater veterans, they have witnessed and documented a lifetime of change. We're the last generation of the original divers. So. They have returned to the Coral Triangle to find out if conservation is working for the reefs around Komodo National Park. The first dive will test Surge. Will he be able to keep up with the 70 year olds? We're going past that sandy feature up there, I think. When we first came here, it was fantastic because that was in 1973. You never know what you're going to see. It's a, I, I find it's a thrill of the unexpected. So let's get into it then. Right. <laughs> Ron and Valerie Taylor are pioneers. They worked on JAWS and developed some of the first underwater cameras. It's unbelievable to get out of uni for a week, to come here and dive with people like Ron and Valerie Taylor. I've done very little diving. To come here on my second trip diving is just unbelievable. Ron and Valerie have had some incredible encounters in the Coral Triangle. Valerie's most memorable was with a tessellated eel. They were on first name terms. Her name was Honey and she was very, very big. She'd see Ron and I coming across the sand and she'd get out of her, her little cave on her rock and swim over and wrap herself around us and hug us and kiss us. She was the sweetest thing. They visited Honey for 12 years. It's because they have spent so much time diving the Coral Triangle that they make perfect underwater guides. For me it was amazing just because the experience they have and what they show you and where they know to look in the reef and things like that to so just find amazing little critters like Valerie was just unbelievable just holding my hand and showing me some of the coolest little animals like things you wouldn't normally appreciate. Oh, that was unbelievable. <sighs> I went to that reef today and I, I was amazed. It blew me away, it really did. But you guys didn't seem too enthused by it. Well, why is that? Uh, well, I, I thought it was a fairly ordinary dive. You see, it's by comparison to what we know that the coral reefs can be like. Yeah. See, I've been diving for over 50 years and uh, I know what it, what it was originally. 
and uh, young guys like you, you come and look at these reefs now and you, you don't know what it was like, yeah. you think it's great, and, and it is really, it's, it's still good, but I just feel disappointed that you probably won't ever see yeah. the oceans like I saw them when I first went in. You know, young people like you will never know how the marine world was, how nature intended it to be. You can't because it's been changed. It's been changed by man. And it saddens me because Ron and I, being so old and having been diving for so long, have seen wondrous things that will perhaps return if areas of the wor world's oceans are left in peace, but it's changed now. You won't see it. Yeah. This is what scientists call shifting baselines as environmental campaigner Wendy Benchley, wife of the Jaws author Peter Benchley, explains. Um, there's a lot of talk about shifting baselines. Um, what's your idea of that? What, what do you believe that is? Ah, well, well, I mean, shifting baselines are that each generation um, sees the ocean with whatever life is in it, and they think that that is a plentiful ocean. But if you talk to somebody like Ron or Val Taylor or Stan Waterman, or I've been diving for 30 years, I see the difference. The ocean is, has about one-tenth the life that I saw 30 years ago, and Ron and Val and Stan will tell you it's got one one hundred. So, but each generation thinks yeah, that yeah, what they're seeing. Of course, seeing so scientists that are studying it now yeah. might not know what actually the reef was like before they even started yeah. studying it, so they're just assuming that it's healthy. Like, yeah. For me, I think a key factor is as well is, is getting youth involved and having people in uh -huh. my generation sort of know about these problems and issues and getting them out there and diving because I, I know very few kids my age that are doing diving, yeah. especially in Australia, and I know very few kids that actually know about these issues as well. One of the main issues for the Coral Triangle is that 126 million people rely on it for food and income. For generations, the local people have remained in balance with the environment. But dramatic population growth and tourism has fueled unsustainable coastal development and increased demand for marine resources such as tuna, shark fin, turtle products and live reef fish. But it's not all bad news. The boat is heading for a location which can survive global change and human threats. Komodo Marine National Park. It was created 15 years ago and the transformation has been remarkable. Chip Scarlett is a scientist as well as an internationally renowned photographer. So you know if you look out here you can see the upwellings that come off of the bottom and what this really is indicative of are the tremendous uh, currents that sweep through this channel basically between the Indian and the Pacific Oceans and they they sweep through here twice a day with the, with the high tides and low tides a tremendous amount of water displaced but most importantly they bring a phenomenal amount of nutrients into the area and it's that nutrients that wash through uh, that really feed the coral they feed the fans this is uh, really what nourishes the whole area Area. At the very end of the dive, just as we finished in the current, we saw one big giant sea turtle this big, and then a second one, and it came down right in front of us, slowly, beautifully. It was a magical moment. And protected around here? Yes, the turtles are protected. In fact, everything is protected, and that's why it's so rich here, because it's been protected for about 15 years, from what I understand. And this is very important, because it's so full of fish, and so full of coral, and it's something that you don't 
don't see everywhere. So we're very happy to be diving here. Absolutely fish full, healthy, gorgeous, rich, full of color, full of life, and it's fantastic. The first time we came to Komodo was probably about uh, 10 years ago. And uh, there's actually been, I'm happy to say, a lot of change for the good. And the best sign of all, and actually the most important, was that we saw a series of pregnant white tip reef sharks. And white tip sharks are very, very good sign of a healthy reef. It's very important uh, to have these types of animals around. They are the top predator on the reef. They keep the reef clean of sick and dying and, and older fish. They also keep the population of parrotfish that would otherwise uh, potentially even destroy the reef uh, through their actions. They keep the, the populations of those fish in check. So to see pregnant white tips here, first time I've ever seen that, and it's a sign that the, the park is really working. Across the coral triangle, sharks are under threat. In the last 15 years, demand for shark fins has boomed on the Asian markets. They're used in shark fin soup, and an estimated 100,000 are being caught each year. The fins are removed, and the sharks are left for dead. Papua New Guinean divers, Bob and Diana Halstead, have seen the effects firsthand. In Papua New Guinea, one of our biggest problems is overfishing. And it's not by the village people doing their traditional fishing. It's by people who have come in and say encourage them to shark fin in particular. It's very, very damaging. When we first started diving, every dive we did, there were sharks. Uh, today, it's much more difficult to see sharks. And this is simply because people have come in. They've come in with fishing gear. They've gone out to the villages. They've given them the fishing gear, taught them how to fish. And then uh, they fished, obviously, taking sharks. And these people come back and just buy the fins. But the problem is that shark finning provides a good income for local people. It is a good price for the village people who don't have another income or other incomes to rely on. It's an excellent price. So when we tell them to limit their take, they say, what will you provide, what will you give us for shark fin to replace this activity that we're involved in? Very difficult questions. What can we give them? What can we substitute these shark cleaning projects with? Local people are being encouraged by WWF and other NGOs to find other ways of making a living. Hello. Hi. 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 <laughs> so basically here we We've got a bit of an alternative to fishing for an income. Culturing pearls can provide a good income for fishermen, especially when they can sell to wealthy visitors. You must have lots of girlfriends at home, mate. <laughs> they get a girl for quite a few strands. Yeah, maybe. I was, I was planning on getting some from mum, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Tourism has provided additional income, and it's not just for diving. Komodo National Park has other attractions. These Komodo dragons are found nowhere else in the world. Tourists will pay big money to get close to dangerous predators. Check it out. These Komodos are bloody tenacious little things, aren't they? As soon as they hear us up here, yeah. they come straight up and follow us. <laughs> you know, look at him. Yeah. He's still coming. Okay, we have to go away. <laughs> we'll get a bit of a head start on him. All right. Declaring the Komodo National Park as a no-take zone 15 years ago has benefited the local communities in other ways. A healthy, protected reef means increased fish stocks, and that means more fish outside the park too. The surge this trip is a brief one. He's got time for one last dive. It's absolutely unbelievable being in a boat with amazing experts and wildlife photographers because they're, they're endangered characters. They're people that have so much life experience. They've done so much with themselves. And so few people in my generation know about it and know about what they've done and will never see the kind of things that they've seen. And I just think it's amazing they have the opportunity to be able to talk to people like that and hear their stories. 
what's your view on like where everything's heading like in the future of all these areas and the cold triangle? Well, well, well as far as sharks are concerned, they, they are in real big trouble. But apart from sharks, my, my, my uh, outlook is positive. I believe that with areas like Komodo, it will become very obvious how beneficial these no-take, these yes. marine protected areas are. The challenge is to expand the number of parks within the Coral Triangle. Bob and Diana Halstead are keen to set them up in Papua New Guinea. We need, we need marine parks, don't we? We definitely That's need marine if you, parks. If you had the marine definitely. parks set up with some people that were determined to do it, do it in a sensible way. I mean, there are lots of models. Komodo is a model that could be used in Papua New Guinea. It's not that simple, but it's hoped that with the success of the marine park at Komodo, other countries around the Coral Triangle will follow suit. So I think that when governments uh, can ally with the non-governmental organizations or NGOs, uh, there's really hope because this whole area here really uh, proves it out. As I said, it takes 10 years. It's not something that just comes overnight. But restricting uh, fishing, restricting the take of the large uh, animals uh, really allows for a healthy ecosystem uh, to build back up again. So when that occurs, I have great, uh, great hope. So this is the rare sort of uh, success story, but one that we certainly hope to see repeated in other parts of the world. If the world does not take action, coral reefs will disappear from the Coral Triangle by the end of the century. Not only will this be devastating for the natural world, it will affect the livelihoods of millions of people. To protect the Coral Triangle, WWF aims to work with governments to set up marine protected areas, encourage sustainable fisheries, protect marine turtles and reduce the impact of climate change. For these pioneers of the diving world, passing on their knowledge means they have an opportunity to bring the Coral Triangle to a wider audience. They're just a whole lot of old-time divers, <laughs> probably all on our last legs. Um, that's something that we can do is like what we're doing now. Yeah, just Talk about it to younger people. The challenge for Serge's generation is to ensure that the wonders of the Coral Triangle don't become something of the past.